I'm Ji Balai from uh, Western University with the SharkNet. And today uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, uh, Julia. This is the second uh, talk of the series Introduction uh, to Julia, a second uh, perspective. Traditionally, uh, one writes code in uh, scripting languages for prototyping and later uh, rewrites it in a composite language su such as a C, C++, or Fortran for performance. Now, with Julia, one needs only one for both prototyping and the performance. And these are the topics uh, we're going to go through today. Uh, some highlights and linear algebra, parallel computing, and the lastly, uh, I'll just uh, put, for, uh, put up uh, some references. Now, uh, please note that this is not a complete systematic introduction to uh, Julia's future, but rather a collection of uh, pointers instead. So uh, you can uh, look it up uh, yourself and at your spare time to learn uh, Julia if you want. So first, uh, some highlights. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at some comparisons with uh, some other languages. And uh, we'll talk about, the, uh, we'll see how, <coughs> you know, why we choose Julia. And uh, we'll touch upon uh, briefly on random number uh, generators. First, uh, let's take a look at uh, some highlights of the, the language. I put them in a comparison table uh, along with MATLAB R. Uh, both are very common to many of us. Julia, uh, as many other languages, MATLAB and R, it has a constant that this uh, example here uh, just shows. This is how you can write a one million in a more uh, clear way. And the Julia supports uh, complex numbers. Uh, so you define the complex number, and you can apply the conjugate uh, on this compl complex number. And uh, Julia has uh, rational numbers, uh, which might be a, a bit of a unique. So it defines the rational numbers in fractions. So for example, it defines a one third. And if you multiply one third by three, it will give you exact uh, one. And as well, uh, numerical uh, literal co uh, coefficients. Uh, here, in this example, you have uh, a polynomial of th degree 3. And instead of writing uh, 3 times x <coughs> to the power of 2 and uh, plus uh, 3 times x, you can simply just put the, uh, the number 3 in front of uh, the variable x, and uh, Julia uh, will recognize that. For example, we define uh, <coughs> uh, x uh, uh, for 40, 47, uh, 47, and if you write type 3x, that will give you 142.41. And here's an example, uh, Julia, uh, we define uh, <coughs> in complex numbers, and also uh, we can put, uh, uh, we can do a conjugate on this complex number, and we get, we'll get a complex number. And uh, let's say uh, y is 1 over uh, 3, that's a rational number. And the three y, let's see what three y will give us. It's one over one. That's exactly one uh, representation. And types. Julia is uh, like a C plus plus C C plus plus in the Fortran. And uh, Julia is a type of language. The notion uh, is just uh, opposite of a Fortran. So uh, you define the, the variable x as an integer. Uh, you can put a 1, 2, 3, uh, double column, and integer. Or uh, uh, you, uh, you can put uh, x equals uh, in 32, and the bracket 1, uh, 2, 3, 4. That will uh, give you integer of uh, 32. And uh, when you uh, uh, define and a function at the end here, define a function uh, inside the bracket, uh, you define the parameter, uh, an argument, 
an, uh, an argument can be of uh, uh, any uh, type. And in this case, example, it's a float 64, which is double. And uh, outside of the bracket in the end, uh, with the trailing double column float 64, which means this return type of a function is of type uh, double or float 64. Structure. Structure is commonly used in non-computational uh, focused uh, applications, but it's getting uh, increasingly uh, used in scientific application uh, as well. In this case, we define a structure of a point, uh, and a point that contains the three uh, coordinates, x, y, and z. And in example here, we define uh, the variable p as a point, we initialize the uh, the variable p with the three values x, y, and z, and then we can refer, we can reference to the components x, y, sorry, x, uh, those two uh, components x and y. We can re uh, reference to uh, the component or member x and y using the dot notation, so p dot x and p dot y um, refer uh, reference to uh, the members x and y. Uh, next example, uh, we define in a structure person uh, which contains a member name uh, of type abstract string. Uh, it's a string uh, defined in a Julia and an ID, which is an integer. And then we define the variable people as person with the square brackets means I, I create an empty array of type person. And then I add uh, a person myself. Uh, to this variable people and using a, a, a function push and a push adds an item to the array and the second push adds another uh, item to the array. So in the end if I uh, display the, uh, the variable people and you will see the variable uh, now contains two, uh, two items, two, two persons. Next, uh, dictionary. Uh, this is a rarely uh, used uh, in numerical computing, but it's very useful in software engineering. In this example, we define a dictionary, uh, a variable D of a type dictionary, uh, dict, uh, with the two uh, items two or two pairs of a key and the values. One as A, uh, A associated with uh, number one, and the B, letter B is associated with, uh, should be two. I, I had a typo here. And then uh, use the function get to to get the, the key value from this variable D by passing in the key, which is A. And the second line, the merge, I given a, a dictionary D, variable D, I want to add another uh, item. So uh, the second argument here is the item to be added to, uh, the, to the existing uh, dictionary D and using a command merge. Uh, here's an example. So uh, first I define the uh, D uh, containing a two, uh, pairs A and the, and the B. So if I'm getting a A, now I'm getting uh, the key A from dictionary D with a default value. If A is not found, then it will return negative one. Otherwise, it will just return the value associated with this key A. So if I do that, I return uh, the value uh, for the letter for the key A. And the second example here, uh, I define a dictionary D with two pairs A and a B. And then I'm adding the third one using a merge. So adding third one C and, and this, let me just run that again. So and that just uh, uh, list the, the content of this dictionary. Uh, variable uh, scope. So now, as you can see uh, in Julia, we can define the variables, and uh, the variables uh, have scopes. In, in Julia, like in MATLAB and R, uh, the variable has two uh, scopes, global and the local. 
if you want to declare a variable as a global, because inside the function, uh, x is global, then you use the keyword global to define x as a global. <clears throat> now, uh, but below the function in Julia, uh, Julia has a statement called the let. So in this example, let x equal, and in this code block, the left hand x is local, the right hand x is global. Okay, so that uh, Julia uh, has a, this uh, kind of unique uh, mechanism for you to uh, to define uh, local variables in such a case. Uh, for example, I define uh, x uh, three, which is global, and then in the let uh, block, I define x equals x plus one. Now, the right hand side x is global, the left hand side x is local. If I run this, as you can see, you would expect that inside this let block, the x value would be three plus one would be four. And let's take a look at what's happening here. <clears throat> As we uh, expected, uh, with the print lane uh, statement, we get a value four. But after outside this let block, it will print uh, display the, the content of uh, variable x again. Now we see the original value x. This is because in the lead block, uh, the x redefined on the left hand side is local. Like in the MATLAB and on R, and, and also uh, in the Fortran as well, and the mathematical functions are all polymorphic, meaning they can be applied to all basic types and arrays. But let's pay attention to uh, the dot uh, operators. This is uh, similar to MATLAB. In Julia, if you uh, if x here is an array, and you want uh, to uh, to make the each element uh, to power of two, then you need to use the dot uh, in front of the power operator. And this even two for functions as well. But in MATLAB and the R, you do not use, you, you can apply the function, the mathematical function, directly to the array types. But in Julia, you need to put the dot in, uh, uh, at the end. So mathematical function in, in Julia uh, it has a different, uh, just different uh, syntax behavior for elemental, elementary, uh, or elemental operations. Uh, continue. Uh, uh, this uh, for loops and uh, while loops and uh, and the conditional evaluations of if, else, if, and and this is all available in Julia. And here's a summary of uh, arrays uh, defined in Julia. Now uh, let's pay attention to a few of them. Uh, for example, in here. Uh, we want to list the all but the kth element. And this is how we do it in MATLAB, one to the end, and then except for the kth element. But in R, which is much simpler, it just uh, put a minus k, and it will display, it will return all the elements in A but kth element. In Julia, Julia is similar to MATLAB. <coughs> you do, uh, <coughs> You will, it, it, this will return all the elements but the kth element. Now, notice that again, we need to put the dot uh, operator here, uh, comparable to, to MATLAB. Uh, this line here, uh, ob object assignment. In Julia, if you simply do B equals A, if A is an array, and uh, Julia is not creating a copy of a B, but instead it makes an alias to A. If you want to create a copy of A, then you need to use a specific special command, uh, a function copy to examination at the end. Then this will 
uh, create a copy of A and assign uh, the content and to B. Uh, here uh, again, uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, the convenient uh, array operations. Uh, this line here, we want to return all the indices of elements greater than B, and this is how we do in MATLAB, R, and the Julia. Now, pay attention to again in Julia that we have a dot operator in front of uh, a greater than sign. And the second line here, uh, once we get the indices, then the re this a square bracket a dot greater than b will return a subarray of elements greater than b. If we want to replace all the elements in a greater than b, then we use this expression dot equal new value, and this will replace all the elements in array a uh, greater than b. And and the corresponding uh, operations in MATLAB and R are listed here. Now, uh, one thing to uh, to keep in mind that in Julia, Julia doesn't have a mechanism like a clear uh, vars or rm in R to uh, release the memory uh, that occupied by an object. If you want to do uh, get rid of the memory uh, taken by an object, pre, uh, previously defined object A, then you can simply uh, reassign A with nothing. Nothing is a keyword, nothing. And then uh, call the garbage collect uh, collector GC to clear up the, the memory. Okay. Uh, quick summary of uh, linear algebra uh, operations. Uh, the, uh, the Julia has the linear algebra operations are pretty much uh, uh, comparable uh, with the MATLAB and the R, except for that the Julia, uh, you need to load the packages, uh, package linear algebra. Um, Julia ships uh, with the basic uh, uh, base systems and along with the various uh, packages, okay? Uh, and the common uh, linear algebra operations is all you can find. You can all find the uh, they, they are available in, in Julia. You can look it up. Uh, look at it up in uh, in uh, in the documentation. Now, just like in MATLAB and in Julia, uh, a function uh, any functions that can return more than just one argument. Uh, for example, here uh, you can return both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, and you can return uh, the single single value of decomposition. You can uh, return a three uh, components after uh, the call to uh, single value of decomposition. And like in R, uh, Julia is also has Julia also has the uh, the linear regression. Uh, Function or support in R. In R, you do uh, linear model and uh, x and y, and then in Julia, uh, the difference is the only difference is that you're gonna uh, load the module uh, GLM, and then you call the function in a similar way, except for that you need to put the macro formula uh, in uh, around uh, this x uh, equal to y. Okay, uh, Julia is a fast. Let's take a look at the, uh, this task. We want to square root a two-dimensional array by loops. And this is what we do. Uh, we define the two-dimensional array A as a random array n by n, and we set to uh, uh, 5,000, maybe I'll just make a little uh, bigger, 8. And then uh, the B, uh, we initialize the B with, uh, with zeros, and then we time the, the nest of the loop, which is a square root uh, elements of A and assigned to B uh, correspondingly. And then we use the time to time this uh, uh, process. So let's see how, how long that it. it will take a couple of seconds. Now, it takes a 5.3 seconds to complete this process. And uh, now, uh, we just change the original code a bit. Let's change it to 8. And 
we put this nested for loops inside the function and then time the function again. Let's see how much time it would take. Now this time it takes only uh, 0 0.1 seconds. Now let's go back and let's see what's happening. Now this, this code, if we use the for loops, nested loops directly, uh, it takes 5.4 uh, seconds. Now pay attention to these things. It says like a 300 million allocations and a five, five gig of memory was allocated. This, that indicates that something's wrong. So that's something that's not, um, not what we want. But if you look at this code again, although there are still allocations, but much less, and this is why there's a code, uh, is faster. And as well, because we put this for loops, nested loops in the function, and the Julia is both a scripting language and also it uses uh, just in time compilation. So it is compiled, this function is compiled, and it runs faster. Well, this example just shows that this function, the Julia, is faster. Now, we'll just give uh, uh, some comparison MyLab code, the Julia, and the Fortran. Again, the timing here uh, is not on this uh, uh, this laptop that I'm, I'm I'm using right now. This was uh, this was done on my uh, old laptop. Uh, my, as you can see, the MATLAB here is actually pretty fast, and the Julia is much faster using the function. If we put the the loops inside the function, it runs much faster. And that the compiled of the Fortran code, the source code is is here. Um, I didn't compile the Fortran code with the fast uh, fast math. Uh, if I did, then my colleagues told me that that I can beat the the, the Julia as well. Uh, so the Julia in this case, Julia performs as fast as the compiled language. Uh, random numbers. I just quickly, uh, as you give a summary, the random number generation uses the uh, Twister libraries of the high quality of random number generators and the libraries uh, through the module random. And before using a random number uh, generator and the functions, to make sure that you load the module random. And uh, the interface is interesting here. And uh, the Julia, the, the random functions designed in Julia uh, has the uh, uh, the API uh, uh, has this uh, uh, replaceable API, uh, a replaceable of our random number generators API in mind. So you can actually, this is in the future, you can actually re uh, replace the random number generators and uh, get uh, the random numbers you want. By default, it will use the uh, Mercer Twister libraries and the random number generators, but this API design allows you to to switch uh, with other uh, random number generators that you prefer uh, in the future. And here, just a quick summary of uh, random number uh, functions. Um, every single one of them has the random number generators the, uh, as an argument. Here's a something that it might be uh, uh, interesting to uh, to uh, some people. For example, rent strings. If you give a string a c g t, uh, it will give you a permutation. It will create a random string from uh, from this uh, the given uh, string. Or rent a perm. It, it, it constructs a random permutation of n items. For example, if you give a five, it will return. Uh, a, a combination of five, uh, one to five, a uh, permutation. Okay. Now, uh, linear algebra, the second big topic. Uh, we will look at the, these uh, four uh, four subtopics: creating arrays, uh, matrix vector or operations, and the solving linear system and sparse matrices. Now, creating a, a, a array. Uh, 
in this example, and the first we create a one-dimensional array, and the second uh, line we create we create a two by five a matrix. And uh, the B here collect, uh, that by the call to function collect on this this is called the ranger. Uh, oh, sorry, this is called the range uh, object. Uh, it generate a range from one to five with increment one. And you need a call to function on range to, to return to you the actual array. Okay. And then you can also call uh, uh, call rand functions and zeros or ones to get you uh, uh, one dimensional or multi dimensional array as you uh, expected. Uh, here's an example of creating a, a five by five uh, matrix A, and then you create a one dimensional array X. And then you multiply by a by x, then they give you a one-dimensional array. Uh, and the matrix vector operations. Now, uh, keep in mind that Julia uses uh, OpenBLAS library uh, under the hood by default. We define the matrix A, the m by m matrix A, and uh, m by m matrix B. And uh, if we want to time it uh, for matrix A times matrix B, get the matrix C. We time this operations by setting the environment variable OMP num uh, OMP num threads, and then I see if the uh, the runtime the execution time will change because the open plus it uses. Uh, uh, uses uh, OpenMP uh, on the underneath, so uh, you can uh, you can change the behavior. You can make uh, you can make use of uh, multi-core uh, speed up by setting the number of uh, threads. So uh, I'm going to skip the uh, the demo here, but just uh, I just want to point it out that uh, you can. Change the you can change the performance. You can change the number of the threads by setting the number of uh, OMP uh, threads. So the o, the underlying uh, Open Plus library uh, will use the number of the threads accordingly to speed up uh, the operations. Solving a dense linear systems, we define a five by five uh, matrix A. And uh, let's uh, let's say this is uh, uh, five by five matrix A, and the type of A is an integer. And define uh, X as a one-dimensional uh, array, and then we we'll create the right-hand side B, and we solve for this mat uh, uh, linear system. Then you should see that we should get the, the solution close to uh, one 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 one. Yes, that's and that the syntax for solving linear system here is uh, exactly the same as MATLAB. Now sparse matrices. Julia uses a compressed sparse column uh, format to store uh, non-zeros. In other words, uh, it stores matrices. By columns in a compressed way. Here's an example again. There's a five by five tridiagonal uh, matrix, and on the right hand side, after you call uh, sparse A, it shows the internal storage. The non-zero elements are stored uh, in column uh, major. Here's an example using a sparse array and. Uh, and then we define a five by five uh, matrix, and I, after a call sparse A, and I define uh, I, I got the sparse matrix uh, A. So here it gives you the internal storage, and then uh, you can do uh, uh, I define a matrix A again, and I define a matrix B, which is a copy of A, and then I multiply uh, A and B. In the sparse storage, 
and the get uh, get a C, which is again in the st sparse storage, and then I call the matrix to show the content in the full uh, format. Let's uh, let's see. This is uh, uh, this is very easy uh, to to verify. Uh, let's just give you an example. Uh, you can also apply a sparse, you can also uh, uh, solve linear system using a sparse uh, matrices. And here's an example. Again, uh, I define a five by five uh, tri diagonal matrix A and make it in the sparse storage and define the X and then define the right hand side B and, uh, and then the, and the use this use the sparse storage A1 instead of the original A and the solve for uh, the linear system that will give, give us the same, uh, same answer. It gives us the same, uh, same, same answer, which, will, which is what we expect that we should get uh, a, a vector close to one, okay. Okay, uh, the last part of this talk, uh, let's take a quick look at the parallel computing or parallel or distributed computing uh, with Julia. In particular, we will look at uh, these five uh, topics, distributing variables and the functions on uh, participating uh, processes. And then we uh, will uh, take a look at a particular example of computing pi uh, using a multi-cores and shared arrays versus the distributed arrays um, uh, for the memory considerations. And the last day we will show how to run uh, parallel or distributed uh, Julia code on cluster uh, gram. Uh, Julia uses the, this concept of the main or master and the worker processes, okay. And distributed, uh, distributed computing in Julia has master and the worker processes in mind. And uh, they can be launched in, uh, in two different ways. First, um, we start a one process, one Julia, and then uh, we, uh, we load the module distributed is the package uh, the package name now by the way in julia all the packages all the packages uh, start with a capital we start the name uh, uh, capitalized okay the first letter uh, capitalized so we load uh, the distributed module and then we spawn eight extra processes so now we have a nine in total or the other way of launching, uh, launching uh, from command line is to use the Julia, which is a command, and with an option P8. So now, bear in mind, this is creating A plus one processes with one as the main process, pretty much doing nothing, but with eight workers. Or on cluster, we can use the uh, Julia, use this option command, Julia, uh, dash dash machine file, host file to, to launch uh, uh, processes on specific node. Well, we'll come to that example in the, in the, uh, at the end. Okay. Now, first, <laughs> let's take a look at how uh, we can broadcast a variable of values uh, to all other uh, processes. This is how we will do. We first will load the modules, uh, distributed the module, and then, then we used a macro. This is a macro, it's not function, it's a macro. Everywhere, at everywhere. Anything that starts with the add is a macro. Everywhere x equal to one, three, uh, one, two, three, four, five. This means we define a variable with the value one, two, three, four, five on every process or on all processes. So next we define x zero to be 
uh, one, two, three, four, five, and I call everywhere x equal x zero, and this will fail. Why this is will fail? This is because on the right hand side, when we call this macro everywhere, it launches, it executes a procedure on every single worker. And x0 is unknown on processes except for the main. So x0, the values are not available, so this will fail. In order to broadcast this value x hold, held in uh, uh, x0, we want to use everywhere, at everywhere x equal, we put the dollar sign here, this works. Just don't ask me why I would put the dollar sign. That's just the defined by, the, that is decided by the developer or designer of uh, Julia. Uh, it, the documentation specification says so. If you put, put the dollar signs, then that, that one, it becomes available. That is just to, to refer, this is to refer the values held uh, in the variable x0, okay. Now, next, uh, executing a function on all processes. This is a slightly different uh, concept. So again, first, uh, we load all the, uh, we load the, uh, the module. We load the module uh, 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 distributed, and then uh, we define the function show ID. We define the function show ID, and then we want to execute this function on every processes. But I'm telling you, this is not going to work. This will fail. Why this is will fail? Because the function is defined here before everywhere. This function is defined locally. This function is locally defined. This function is defined within this process, the main process. So when you call everywhere, again, when you call everywhere, you are calling a procedure on the remote process. And this, because this function is not defined on the remote processes, but the main one here, so this will fail. The correct way of doing this is, everything else is, will be the same, except for that we define this function everywhere. We define the function, here's this everywhere. We define this function everywhere on uh, uh, all the processes. Okay, and this function will just print the uh, the ID. My ID as a building function, it returns the ID of the current running process. And then after this function is defined, this function is defined everywhere, defi defined on every single process because we're calling everywhere. And then calling everywhere uh, this function name, it will work. Let me uh, let me just show you an example here. So I'm I'm running I'm starting at Julia with uh, a workers, okay, and then I call the function workers. Let's see how many workers, eight workers. Yes. If I do m prox, how many processes do I have? It says nine. Why is nine? Because um, it starts a plus one. It always, Julia always starts n plus one with one extra uh, main process. Okay, uh, I want to do uh, the first thing I need to do is the using uh, this distributed uh, to load the module, and next uh, I'm going to define the function everywhere. And we need to define it well, now. I am defining this function everywhere. So my ID and then my ID and 
So this function is a defined show ID. Now if I just run show ID, guess what we'll get? We'll get my ID is one. Why? Because the show ID is run on the current process or this local process. My local process ID is one. Uh, my local process is the main process. If I do everywhere, show ID. Now I'm calling this function on every single uh, worker. Then we will see an array of IDs. Now pay attention to the output. It comes back in a random order. Okay, there's no guarantee that it will come in the sequential order. Okay. Uh, next, uh, continue uh, executing a procedure remotely. Now, remember I, I said by calling ex everywhere, we actually were executing a procedure remotely. Okay. And Julia has defined a number of uh, other uh, ways of uh, running uh, running a, a procedure remotely. Uh, the spawn macro again uh, is a way to to execute the procedure on a remote process, on one remote process. Here, uh, this example, uh, we, want to, we want to run this, this uh, uh, procedure, uh, x to the power of two, and then return uh, the ID, return the ID of the process that uh, executed this, this procedure. Now, this statement, the spam, will will find a automatically find a uh, will automatically choose a process and run it. And the Julia uses the concept of future, referring to the re remote execution. So this this uh, a statement is executed uh, asynchronously somewhere and return the reference or handler f in order to see the content we need a call we need you want to see the result of the this execution we need a call fetch we need a call fetch on the future future is an object here okay Another concept of the future uh, is uh, available in other languages, for example, uh, C++, but it might be uh, uh, foreign to uh, some of us uh, familiar with traditional uh, programming languages like Fortran or R or uh, MATLAB. Okay. Now the second example here, spawn add, uh, provides another convenient way to execute to run a procedure on a specific process. In this case, it's three. Spawn at the process ID and the procedure. Okay, so it's uh, it's quite straightforward to understand. Uh, the function remote call uh, is similar to spawn, the, the macro spawn at, except for the, uh, in this example here, uh, we call remote call the remote call will execute this command, will execute, will find the maximum element in this variable x on one of the workers, okay? That's a syntax. So here's the argument is the variable and the where and the what. Again, it returns a future because this call is asynchronous. You don't know when uh, uh, it will be uh, completed and where. So you need a call fetch to get the result. And also, uh, Julia has a remote call and a fetch. It combines these two together. So this, as you can expect, that that's a synchronous call. It, it will return until uh, it, it, it will uh, call and return the result. Okay, so it will find the maximum elements of x and on one of the the workers. Okay, so this is a comb this combines the two uh, two calls together, remote and the fetch. So it's a synchronous call. Um, 
and the Julia also uh, provides a, a mechanism for communicate uh, for uh, communication between uh, uh, tasks. Uh, the mechanism is called a channel. In this example, uh, we create the two channels, C1 and the C2. Uh, the size of the channel uh, is 1024 uh, for both. And inside, we define this function foo, uh, or you can see as a you can uh, see it as a procedure. In this, in, inside this function, we simply um, just sitting in the infinite loop and the take a task from channel one and the process the data and the put the results back put the result back to channel two okay and this is like a consumer a producer consumer a pattern we take the one computational task is off the queue and then and do something about it and then put the result back to another queue okay now the reason I put a function here now as you remember uh, we uh, in the uh, example that we show uh, previously that uh, if you put the nested loop inside the function and the Julia compiles it and runs faster. Okay, so we put this loop inside this function inside this procedure defined as a foo, and then uh, we <coughs> schedule n instances of foo by using a for loop and instances and then we just executed this function foo or procedure foo asynchronously we don't care the, the, the order uh, how the uh, the tasks are uh, are taken or popped off the one queue and uh, the re result results are uh, pushed back to another queue okay this is an example of it using a, a, a channel uh, next, uh, let's take a look at the uh, uh, example of computing a pi uh, using a multi-cores. So we're just uh, toss uh, points uniformly distributed uh, inside this uni uh, unit uh, square, and we count the number of points inside the circle versus the number of a point, the total number of a points, and then I guess uh, we're just uh, looking at uh, into, uh, the and our experiments in this one quadrant and uh, and then we as a multiply by four then that will give us approximation to pi uh, let's take a look at how we're going to do this in Julia so first we uh, do uh, we define the function we count the number of points inside a circle which is loop over number of points and we generate x and y randomly and by calling the function ren and the ren here uh, it's uh, it returns uniformly distributed random numbers between uh, 0 and 1 and then we assign the value this value on the right hand side uh, it, it is just a boolean uh, whether uh, it's a true or false if it is true then it's a one uh, otherwise it will be zero so we uh, we increment this n underscore in which is inside number of points inside and then in the end we just return the uh, number of uh, inside points and then we define another uh, function which is for our convenience uh, called the pi estimate parallel and we get first we get a number for workers and then we call distributed macro this is a function over a loop there's a loop over a uh, number of uh, workers and for each worker which is do uh, this many uh, uh, points just one over P a uh, portion of uh, a total number of uh, points and uh, this distributed bracket plus it's a reduction a reduction on the for loop okay and after this loop after this parallel loop or distributed loop and then return this function returns the approximation of a pi and this is how we uh, uh, how we run it we start the four processes and the load the modules distributed and the load everywhere 
sorry, we everywhere we include the function defined in this file. This means that we, on every single worker, we include this function. So the function will be defined on every single worker. And then we simply just call this on, on main. On the main process, then it will automatically distribute it to other processes and get uh, our results. This is this is the example of Pi, computing Pi. Uh, next, I'll talk up uh, uh, quickly. Uh, talk about the the par uh, shared arrays uh, versus uh, uh, distributed array. And the Julia has the uh, two packages: shared arrays and distributed arrays. With the shared arrays. Julia will create a copy of array on every process, every worker or every process. And distributed array, and distributed array will create a array stored across processes. So instead of having a copy of the entire array, then each process processes a chunk of the storage and therefore uh, saves uh, overall uh, space. Okay, so here we have uh, using uh, shared arrays and we define A as a shared array, uh, shared array equals shared array, uh, that's it's float 64 to dimensional um, let's define n as a phi 5000 and the a will be a shared array float 64 two dimensional and the m by n Okay, so now we have a shared array, and this array is available on every single uh, worker. And let's take a look at uh, how much memory that each take. Now, you see we have a, a whole bunch of a Julia process here, and the total number of uh, the amount of a, a memory on each process is about 1.2 gig. Okay. Now uh, let's quit. Okay, and using distributed arrays. Oops. Distributed arrays, and that will create a distributed object. Uh, we use the five thousand, and that's going to a is a D rand five by five. Now this array will be stored across uh, eight workers. Let's take a look at uh, the Julia process again. Now, uh, as you can see, uh, each one takes much less memory. It's not a 1.2 gig because now the the uh, this distributed array uh, is a shared among uh, shared. Uh, it's stored across uh, different nodes. Okay, so last, uh, let me uh, uh, let me just show you how to how to run this Julia code on on, on Gwen. Okay, on, on cluster. I'm not going to do the demo, but just uh, show the code. Uh, in this code, uh, I'm loading uh, the di distributed pa uh, package module, and then uh, this for loop does nothing but just re each worker will get its ID process ID and the host name. So within this for loop, we loop over workers, loop over workers, 
and then I call the fetch and fetch on the suspend at macro on worker I, uh, worker one, two, three, four, uh, all the way to a number of workers. And on each one of them, uh, I'm just returning the process ID, uh, sorry, the, the Julia process ID and the Unix process ID and uh, the host name and to print them out inside this loop, okay? And then after I'm done, I just remove the, the workers, just de, uh, uh, de delete the, the, the workers from the pool. Now let's take a look at what the, the job submission uh, script will look like. The job submission uh, script looks like this. First, uh, I define I'm going to run uh, 64 processes. And this is uh, 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 in the content of the MPI processes, okay? So distribute, I'm using a 64 processes. And uh, the CPU per task is one. The memory uh, per CPU is 124, this is by default. And the runtime, uh, five, <coughs> five minutes. And my account, using a default account, and I just gave uh, the output, I just gave a name. Now, these two lines uh, are important for running the Julia. The first line, I'm using srun hostname dash host to generate a host file without the main name. The general host file on gram will be a gram 127, 132, 256, and so on and so forth. And this S run host name will return, once allocated, 64 entries of nodes. And I, I put them all into a file, to the host file. And then I start a Julia with the option dash dash machine file, host file generated by S run. And then run this Julia code. This is how we uh, start a whole bunch of uh, workers uh, with the option machine file. Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, point you to a number of uh, references in the Julia documentation and a quick summary of Julia and a very good uh, uh, lecture notes uh, distributed in, in a parallel uh, system uh, by Professor Mark Mariano Massa uh, from the uh, Department of Computer Science at Western University.